Hello, everyone. I'm Christopher Canizares, partner at Hauser & Wirth. Thank you for joining us today to celebrate our inaugural exhibition with George Kondo, aptly titled Internal Riot. The show is installed in our new gallery at 542 West 22nd Street, and it remains on view through the third week of January. Now, given pandemic restrictions and in the interest of safety, we're scheduling time visits and hope that you'll make a reservation on our website to come see the exhibition in the flesh. Uh, it opened on Thursday of last week, and it's incredibly beautiful. Um, before we begin the conversation you've all come to hear between George Kondo and Massimiliano Joni, we have a brief video walkthrough of the exhibition we'd like to share with you. Thank you all again for joining us. Uh, this digital event is closed captioned. So to use this function, simply click on the closed captioning icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and if you'd like to submit a question uh, during the run of this talk, uh, please do, do so using the Q&A icon down there too. There'll be a Q&A session at the end. Um, and so now it's my pleasure to hand this off to Massimiliano. Hello and uh, welcome everybody. And thank you so much for uh, the invitation to, to be in conversation today with uh, George Kondo, who is a friend and an artist I greatly admire. And um, I think we're gonna just jump straight into the conversation. I think there is no better introduction than hearing George himself uh, talk about his work. And uh, we are really in for a treat uh, because George is one of the, the most pyrotechnic <laughs> speakers and conversationalist I know. So welcome, George, and great to see you. And congratulations for a wonderful show. And uh, so let's start by talking about this new cycle of paintings, and uh, which is called Internal Riot. Uh, I believe there are 11 works in the show, all the same format, uh, which gives it a, a, a nice sense of unity. Um, I think when we talked about it, you, you somehow described it as a, a kind of Warhol-esque uh, cycle of, uh, of canvases. So how did the project develop? How did this show start it and, uh, and what inspired it? Well, it, you know, it started a long time before the um, actual invitation to do an exhibition. During the time when I was out here in March and I left the city, um, I began this sort of distanced figures uh, pieces, which were kind of based on the idea that I was unable to be in touch with anyone um, other than just the landscape and this and that. And then 
So I'd done some distance figures drawings and they were figures that were definitely sort of torn apart in space and also torn apart internally. And then um, as the summer sort of moved in and the invitation came to do an exhibition in uh, November, I started to think of a consistent body of work in the sense I looked at the, the, the view of the space and I thought, oh, you know, I always loved the idea of the Andy Warhol portraits always being the same exact size. And his dream was to put them almost like the shadows, you know, mm -hmm. like side by side all around the museum and the mat he wanted to do. And, um, and I thought these are gonna be portraits. They won't be like Warhols. They won't be anything to do with that, but they will have a similar scale and they will employ all kinds of techniques, you know, that bring out the fractured aspects of today's society, you know, and the society we lived through. I mean, now we're post-election, nobody knows what's coming next. Everybody's happy. I mean, I certainly am happy that uh, it's worked out that Trump is no longer with us. <laughs> but uh, before that, it was all this incredible, you know, fractured, divisive, and, uh, and, and terribly horrifying with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of melancholic aspects to the show, which are regardless of the bright colors and regardless of the sort of, I hope there's some kind of bravura in the painting itself, they all relate to this um, idea of a kind of dislocation between who we really are and where we really are in, in this pandemic and in this political landscape. And, and many of the, the paintings actually um, feature a central figure that is actually somehow multiplying or, or, or yeah. breaking up or in, in a fight with itself, right? And uh, uh, like the, the central work called uh, Internal Riots Suggest. And some are also, as it typically happens with your work, uh, recall strange cartoon figures. Now there is one that looks a little bit like uh, Sylvester the Cat or, or yeah. Bugs Bunny. Um, yeah, and, they uh, and they really are those those guys, but they are, they are in a strange way. I always think of these cartoon-like figures. They, they are personifications mm -hmm. in the beginning of some real person. They are then transformed into a, a cartoon. But then once they step out of the cartoon and come back to reality and to the real world, this sort of metamorphosis of who, <laughs> from a cartoon to a her, human, is, is, is what is, and, and what we've done is we've, there's been a kind of metamorphosis of some sort of us sort of being turned inside out and coming back into the world as who we thought we used to be. We may be somebody different than we thought we used to be. I didn't even recognize my own apartment the first time I went to it in New York. I hadn't been there in nine months and I thought, who lives here? You know, whose place is this? You know, you know what I mean? And I thought, I've come back as a new person already. I, you know, I thought it was an interesting coincidence that some of your characters from the 80s, you describe them as pods. Uh, yeah. Now pods is a word that many of us are forced to use. We, we use it to mean a small group that is quarantining together, uh, which I don't think is what your pods were, were wow. inspired by. But uh, so you want to talk a little bit about those characters and, and where the name came from or, or what they stood for? Well, I, I discovered a book by Aldous Huxley called Heaven and Hell. And it's an interesting book because it was written after he wrote the book, The Doors of Presumption. And he starts to talk about in the antipodes of our uh, subconscious exists a kind of complete civilization of characters that go back to how we might have defined angels or or demons or things that you would see in a uh, a Bosch painting, mm -hmm. and he and so I and so he so I started thinking like these people these characters that live within us but as what he's what he was saying, these antipodal beings that live within the periphery of our mind are out like out in the bleachers cheering and they're working sort of forklifts and they're readjusting the molecular structure of your brain constantly. And if you come into contact with them, 
if you ever go so far into your subconscious that you actually meet them, they make it very clear that they don't want you around. <laughs> so, <laughs> they don't want you knowing about them. And so I, ma I made a painting one night and I was in the, uh, it was like 10, 1996. And I made a painting in the evening and I woke up the next day and I, I realized I didn't really spend a lot of time after I painted it looking at it. I just did it and went to bed and I woke up and there he was. And it was Big Red, you know, the one that we showed at the new museum. And I thought this is the first antipodal being. This was me capturing the antipodal uh, characters. And then I started to call them, to shorten it, pods. Yeah. I started calling them pods, you know, rather than something that complicated, like what is an antipodal being, you know? So yeah. I said, these are the pods. And then pods became like a, a catchphrase. I, I, after the 90s, all of a sudden there were pods and there was the iPod and there was the, this pod and the, that pod. And it was very funny that it, morph into common language. You know, the, the mention of Huxley makes me think of uh, uh, the way in which literature often plays in your work. You know, many people see the, the, the strange characters in your paintings and uh, of course they can detect, you know, references to cartoons, to Disney, mm -hmm. etc. cetera, but um, maybe it's less known the fact that you, you really have an encyclopedic knowledge of literature, of music, uh, of painting itself and, and that uh, literature and also uh, the kind of prophetic figures like Axley or like Borrocks have played uh, um, an important role in your work and also in your life. I mean, nowadays we, we speak and spend hours thinking of viruses and, uh, and um, William Borrocks was uh, notoriously fascinated by ideas of uh, uh, epidemics, uh, contagion. One of his most celebrated quotes is language is a virus, whatever mm -hmm. that means. And uh, you, um, you were friendly with him and you had opportunities to spend time with him and also with his dear friend, Brian Geison. Um, how do you think back of at William Borrocks in this time, particularly in which many of his prophecies seem to become true, uh, both on a political level and also, you know, with his um, visions of uh, epidemiological warfare and, uh, and contagion. Well, it, there's no question that William was an unbelievably prophetic writer. You know, most people sort of try to pigeonhole him into this kind of an idea of like, he wrote Junkie, so he must have been a heroin addict or whatever. But by the time I met him, he was not that person anymore. He was somebody that was looking at art, anything from Grunewald to, uh, you know, uh, contemporary art. And he was, he was very much into this idea that the police and the violence created by the police was um, directed towards, it, there was a very homophobic, sort of tendency during the time where Burroughs who was obviously openly gay and he felt as if there's an incredible homophobic uh, situation with the police. So he in kind of inverted this whole situation to the point where it was the police that were the ones who were um, the most sort of decadent or whatever and it was the it was the establishment that was incredibly decadent. That in fact he almost nailed it to the point of saying it's this radical right wing. He really put his finger on the idea of a radical right. That it's not the radical left that you think about back in the '60s, turning cars upside down and burning them during the Vietnam War. It's this radical right uh, wing that are creating all this disinformation. I mean, he was all about disinformation. He was all about uh, secret agents. And he was all about the idea of language as a virus and the idea that a, a piece of misinformation can get out there like a virus. And all of a sudden it affects people and people start to believe in this uh, false or misinformation. And there's, a, there's going to be a conflict over this misinformation because it's so believable, but it's not true. So he really captured in a lot of ways back in those books like, you know, the, um, the ticket that exploded 
for example, or the Western lands or in uh, the exterminator, um, all that, all of that, and more so in, than anyone I can think of. And also his technique was very contemporary. His technique was very much like, if you're watching a television, you're in the middle of uh, MSNBC, and all of a sudden you're watching it and they say, we'll be right back after this message and there's a cut and it's Subway sandwiches, you know, okay. or it's, it's, it's Olive Garden or it's some crazy, you know, cheesy looking pizza and has absolutely nothing to do with the subject of the news. Yeah. But yeah, it's connected in some, some conscious way that you think, you know, there's no way the human brain can disconnect those things. They've just seen it. And once you start flicking channels, every different channel has some form of different information. So he started to do that with the cutouts, where he would take, I mean, of course, if we know Tristan Zara during the period in the surrealism would take letters out of a hat and put them together and make sentences. But I think between him and Geisen, that was their real contribution to a new form of literature, this idea of can I ask you just for uh, anecdotal purposes, how did you meet Barrocks and uh, did you ever do anything together? Did you do a book together or not? Yeah, like in 1990 or 89, the Whitney was doing a series of artists and writers and they asked me who would I like as a writer? And I met Brian in Paris in 1985 with Keith Haring. And um, so we would go see Brian quite frequently. And then Brian, I never met William at that point. And then they asked, who would you like to work with? What would be a great writer for you to work with? They sent me a stack of books of different writers, contemporary writers. I said, I'd like to work with William. He's still working. He's got new material. Yeah. And so my, my um, literary agent that I was with, Andrew Wiley, who represented William uh, Burroughs, he just picked up the pay phone and then he called him in Lawrence, Kansas. And he said, all right, William's on the phone, have a conversation. <laughs> I had a conversation with Burroughs and he told me he liked what I wrote about Geisen in Geisen's last exhibition catalog. He liked the essay. So that he would be willing to have me come down to Kansas and we could do some work together. And we could, he would be willing to have the Whitney publish a first edition where I did the etchings with Aldo Cromlink in Paris. And then I basically went back to New York from Paris and then I went to William. And then we did about, a, I don't know, 60 paintings together. He loved to paint, but he wasn't really a painter per se, but it was like a physical activity for him. <laughs> and he, but the greatest thing about working with William as a painter, you know, and as a collaborator on paintings beyond literature was he would see a paint splat. And then he would identify the paint splat as, He'd say, you know, but look at that one. I'm like, that's one of your boys. You know, like that comes right out of your language. And this, this, this looks like, and he would have a narrative. And the best thing was his titles to the paintings mm -hmm. because they were like a literary genius that would come up with them. And, you also you know, told me that uh, you would open up drawers in the kitchen and so said there would be guns everywhere. The, Is that true? Honestly, <laughs> I went to the studio one day and I was looking for some pencils. William said, go in there, I'll be in there in five minutes or something. I opened up this one drawer and there were about a hundred pistols from 1920 to 1960, vintage pistols. And so I just, I, I thought to myself, well, that's really scary. You know, I've never had a gun before and I've never seen them really other than just, and so, William comes in and his hands were very shaky at that time, because he was about 80 something. And uh, it goes into that drawer and starts shaking around all these guns. And I said, are those guns loaded? And he said, he pulls one out and it looked like a Derringer, you know, like a real sort of Bonnie and Clyde type of gun. Pulls it out and rolls it and says, there were bullets <laughs> in all the holes. And he said, what good is a loaded, what good is an unloaded gun? And I said, I don't know, it's scary, you know? It was very scary. It was super scary because like, they really were loaded guns all over the house. Yeah. But he was into like shooting. I mean, you know, he liked shooting, I don't know.
And do you think that this notion of the cut up influence also the way you work on your paintings? I mean, obviously in this last show, we see a lot of uh, fraction figures, but um, did he also change the way you approach painting as a, a collage or as... Um... Yeah, I mean, in the sense that like languages in art, like the language of the Baroque uh, kind of painting and the language of abstract expressionism. And there was a non-linear kind of um, uh, understanding of the way painting itself can work. There's no rule. Why does it have to start from today? Why isn't today, you know, 300 years ago and a thousand years ago? And so suddenly I started to think like, you know, within the midst of a painting that suddenly appears to be moving that direction, there's a, there's a, I don't know what you'd call it. it. It's not a reference. It's a presence, like in the words of Heidegger. You know, there's a kind of presencing of a different appearance. There's an appearance and there's a presencing. And the difference between an appearance is like the appearance of something as opposed to the being of something. So you've got the being of something, which is a a uh, Heg Hegelian term, which is the actual thing, but then you've got the presence of that being, the presence of that moment. So in the paintings, what happens is for a split second, you think you see that, and it reminds you of something, it's something familiar, it comes from the language of maybe the Renaissance or the Baroque or the 19th century or early 20th century. It looks like Picasso, but you put it next to one and it looks, doesn't look anything like it. Um, and I think the idea of incorporating all these different languages simultaneously in a painting is part of this sort of what I got out of Burroughs, let's just mm -hmm. say, it, of the cut ups. There is also though, a quality that, uh, you know, I'm absolutely ignorant when it comes to music, but uh, one could say that uh, uh, this idea of different styles coexisting in your work. Um, is also somewhat rhapsodic or, or um, again, you know, a different form of cut up is obviously that of hip hop music with which you, you have flirted in a sense by realizing also covers for, uh, for celebrated musicians like Kanye West uh, and failed politicians like Kanye West. <laughs> but um, <laughs> the, um, the question I have is also if and how music played. You, you are also a guitar player, you play the, uh, the Viola, so is no, that also a notion? No, I, what happened was is, you know, when I was a kid, I was always painting and drawing. And then at a certain point when I was maybe about 14, I decided to think, I thought, you know, I have to come up with another one. And, and then I started to study classical guitar and classical music. Mm -hmm. And as like, I would put hours into it. And then alongside of, drawing and painting and I trying to think like what am I going to do you know when I grow up or whatever and I, I got to college and I decided to split my interest between music theory because I wanted to know how it works and uh, art history I didn't want to take any studio classes whatsoever I didn't want any influence on the way I painted I didn't want somebody to tell me I did this wrong and so but with music, there is a right and a wrong. And that abstractly, and from an abstract position in painting, there isn't, um, which is a very different form, you know? So if you're supposed to play a B flat and you hit a B, you've obviously hit the wrong note. But with painting, any mistake you make can lead you onto a new journey and become like the piece itself. So painting and composing are very similar. So when I think about the idea of performing music, it's quite different than the idea of performing, say, a painting. Mm -hmm. You only in the sense of rhythm. When uh, a piece is broken down into a number of different, you know, uh, let's just say there's four movements to a piece. One of them is a slow movement, another one, an andante or or something like that, and the next one is a is a presto vivace. Okay, so it, none of them. None of those pieces of music allow the musician to fuck it up. You're not allowed. So if you're painting as fast as you possibly can, you're painting the way when you hear 
a tumultuous run of, of Beethoven in the Appassionata, when he reaches the end, where there's just like an incredible number of, you know, tumultuous number of notes all of a sudden happening. And then it goes to a space, and then it goes to a chord section. And you could think about, you know, in working now with this musical project that I'm doing, which is a film, and that it, I commissioned the, um, the composer, Matthias Pincher, okay, who's a very incredible composer, all right? He's, he's unbelievable. And he's written, you know, violin concertos, this, that, and the other thing. And then my partner, Lila Josefowitz, who we've been together for the last few years, we play, she plays music all the time around me. She's either practicing something or another, or, or and I'm listening to it and I'm painting, or, or she's home practicing one way or the other. But what was interesting was to have a conversation with Pincher, okay, about music. And he said, what really fascinated him was Barnett Newman, that the zip represents that space between a really large moment, like take Beethoven's fifth, the opening, everyone knows, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like, there's a, there's a zip and then it comes back again. And the second time it's shorter and he's, he's measuring his musical notation and his concepts about music by artistic, um, by art, by visuals. Mm -hmm. So what you see when you see like the two sort of floating squares in a Roscoe and what's in the middle, there's this, there's this density and then there's lightness and then there's density. So having studied music to the extent that I have, didn't make me a great player, but it may be a good listener. So basically that, that's all I can say. Was there any music that you listened to particularly during this uh, cycle of paintings or? During the cycle of paintings, I listened to Lila playing a lot of the Bach, which she's going to perform on the 20th. There's gonna be on, on the 17th and she's gonna do a virtual live stream of the, um, on the site of the Matthias Pincher piece that I commissioned from him, which is based on a drawing. And it's called The Drawing for Violin, which is a really beautiful piece. It's never been heard before. It'll be heard for the very first time on the site like we're doing now. But um, I listened to a lot of West Montgomery. I listened to it over and over again. I listened to a lot of Coltrane. I listened to a lot of Hendrix. I didn't really listen to classical music in my studio because I can hear Lila play it. And I'd rather hear it played live in front of me or next to me. It's so much more exciting because, you know, she might try 20 different versions of one piece. And so I get to hear, because I love comparative listening. Mm -hmm. I love to listen to five different cellists play the Bach cello suites, or I, I love to listen to 20 lute players play Capsburger, you know, and, and esoteric music people don't know about the Vieux Gautier, Charles Mouton, all these 18th century French writers of music. And so I love to listen to numerous different players mm -hmm. and get an idea of like what they're doing. And, and well, that's, uh, that's also right. interesting in relation to these paintings um, and other cycles of yours, you know, there is this. Uh, kind of variation on a theme that, that yeah. becomes quite interesting, you know, in the choice of the format, in the choice of the characters. It's like you're setting up yourself um, a, a repertoire and then you play within their repertoire, no? That's so perfect because like, I, I want, I'm glad you said that because in the D minor, um, you know, suite for solo violin of Bach, in the Chacon, there are 64 variations on a single theme. And the idea of musical variations on motifs, okay, the idea that the motif is a single portrait in the sort of in the center, actually in a diagonal, sort of caught in a sort of diagonal network of geometric lines, there's always a portrait. There's always a person either trying to escape or trying to reconcile its differences within himself mm -hmm. or trying to say, hey, I'm human, I'm alive. Don't 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 just drive by and not pay attention to me. I'm a homeless person. I'm a I'm somebody, but I but I, pr I appreciate you looking at me for a second. It's not like you just when 
one of the things I always felt that was so sad was like a lot of homeless people will say, just to be recognized for a second, for a split second, for somebody to just sort of wave or something like that, it's not always that they want money. They just want to be recognized as humans. And so within these works, there's this idea that I want to recognize those people as humans, no matter how transient and how fractured they all really are. And so um, <clears throat> I think the variations are on that concept, you know, that there's a diagonal that goes from left to right or from right to left. And that's the simple geometric framework concept. Very simple. It's a line this way and a line that way. Because um, I thought within that, there's a lot of, I don't know, to take the simplest motif and expand it into so many different multiple um, variations is what I really wanted to do. And, and they're, I, improvisations, I, they're improvisations as well. Yeah. On, within that. I want to ask you another, um, something about another encounter of yours of which I'm very jealous. And that is, um, uh, also because we are speaking about repetition and difference in a sense, is um, your encounter and your collaboration with Felix Guattari, uh, mm -hmm. who wrote about your work. And, um, you know, uh, and I think he's uh, thinking, particularly also his work with uh, Gilles Deleuze is interesting in relation to this fracture portraits. Now the, the two of them, I, I, I'm probably misquoting, but I remember in, um, it must be in anti Oedipus, they say we wrote this, uh, the two of us, and we were already two men, you know. They were mm -hmm. the two writers, they kind of glorified, um, sometimes maybe naively, they glorified the idea of schizophrenia as a, yeah. a, a form of liberation or a form of insubordination. Um, and, uh, and obviously, I assume that Guattari was also curious about your work for this, for the way in which you imagine multiple characters. And so you want to tell us a little bit how you met them and did you meet also Deleuze or uh, you met? Uh, I, didn't, I did not get a chance to meet Deleuze. Yeah. I, wanted, I wanted to, but Felix, <clears throat> when I lived on the Rue de Condé in Paris in 1985, Felix actually lived two floors above me. Okay, he actually, he may have been one floor above me or two floors, I don't, I'm not sure. But in any case, I'd see Felix come in and I would say, you know, this is Felix Guattari, he's, he's teaching semiotics and he's teaching, you know, he's teaching all this new language, but he's also working at Laborde, which is like the schizophrenic clinic down in, you know, this, in France. And he had done the book on Bacon with Deleuze and um, he knows a lot about art, but his, so when I said to him, hey, hello, Felix, you know, I'd love to spend time with you. He was a very, uh, what do you call it, a bon vivant to a certain degree, but his house, it, within his house, I remember his collection was Antonin Artaud drawings. And we would look at the drawings of Artaud and we would talk about Artaud. And then he was telling me he's studying, you know, schizophrenia and saying that there's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just an, it's just a, um, it's a condition that doesn't allow um, people to function in the world that we function in. However, they function within their own world as long as they're contained to some degree. And he was talking about going down to the clinics where the schizophrenic people think, hey, lock the doors, you know, don't let them in, <laughs> you know, don't, don't, let, don't let them in because we're fine. And so they were more concerned about us and we kind of would be about them. They thought they would destroy their, their sort of, uh, let's just say the freedom of having, you know, multiple personalities. And as long as they were not uh, dangerous and, and a threat to society, the idea of having multiple personalities was almost a, uh, in Felix's mind, was almost a phenomena that he wanted to explore how those multiple personalities could be then transposed into an artistic uh, kind of field. Mm -hmm. So I think what he was looking at in my paintings were the idea that there were these uh, interplay of multiple languages and interplay of multiple imagery and the idea of um, controlling a chaotic, uh, situation, like the idea of ordering chaos mm -hmm. to a certain degree of having 
chaos be your subject? And then your idea is to turn chaos into an aesthetic object and to make it work as an image and to make it work as, and it may in, in contain multiple images and you might need in order to get those multiple images, you may need to forget who you are and become something else. And he wrote about your work and when he did what he focus on, or uh, I was looking for the text this morning and I couldn't find it to tell you the truth. <laughs> so I I have to he, he wrote like a lot, you know, and then he shortened it. He wrote a lot and then we shortened it down. He edited it down um, to like much less, but he did numbers of hours of tapes. And yeah. then we transcribed it down to something that would work in 1990 in an old yes. gallery catalog. I wish the whole entire piece was there because of all the conversations we had together that were recorded. But we spent did a little time. Did you go to the clinic with him or not? You didn't go to the clinic. And he wanted me to, but yeah. I never, I ended up, you know, having exhibitions or doing other things. And, you know, he, you know, he, he knew my working patterns because he said he could hear me at night. And at that <laughs> time, I used to work late at night. I'd work from about 11 at night until five in the morning. Now I do it the other way around. Now I work very early and then I'm done at one o'clock in the afternoon. I have lunch, take it easy, and then I go back and work a little more. But Actually, since we're talking about routines of work, um, you know, I, I noticed that these paintings, you dated them uh, in the front, which I don't know if it's the first time you do, yeah. and you dated them to the day. Yeah. And, and so there is almost a kind of chronicle uh, feeling to the show that, that kind of describes these last months uh, that you've been working on them. Um, they also, the presence of the date makes them feel um, somewhat more urgent in the sense that they, you know, they are very much a diary of this moment. And yeah. I was wondering if, um, if that's the case and if that's how you work usually or it's specific totally. to this series. That was my idea. My idea was like, if I make it Every day, that when you read about the numbers and you read about the virus and you read about everything, you think to yourself, every painting has to be painting like it's my last painting and I'm gonna date it like the day I finish it. So they're not dated like the day I started. They're dated like I might have, a painting that says September 16 may have been started on September 10th, but like ultimately when it's finished, I date it that day and each, each, one was like a notch of of a moment of life where you say this piece was like i lived long enough to do that piece then i lived long enough to do this piece i made this chronological sort of uh diary as you call it of of just being able to say live long enough to do these pieces mm -hmm. and 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 want to make that a very important uh fact in the in the work you know it's a part of the painting is the date on these works to say and and to look at the dates and to think what do they correspond with politically so if somebody was to say you know may 10th you know what happened in the world on may 10th what happened in the world on june you know when were the riots and during the riots in new york when and california and chicago and down south when the cars were burning and when everything was burning that's about the time that i probably did the internal riot painting because I wasn't there. So it was happening, you know, from a distance again, it was like, and it was internally, I was internally affected by seeing these images on the news and they become like ingrained in your mind, like as if you're watching a movie and you think this isn't a movie, this is real. You I wanna ask you something, since we are talking about, let's say history or history in the making, um, you know, you, you came to New York, uh, it, was it 79 or 78? Yeah. I don't remember. Seven, so obviously, um, and you lived in the East Village in the Lower East Side. And um, so obviously you have seen New York also in a moment of a great crisis. Um, yeah. And you have also seen New York in the 80s. Uh, and, and so you've seen this city in, in, in very different phases of its life. I want to ask you a little bit, about your experience coming to New York when uh, uh, when you moved here and uh, uh, and the encounters you made when you came in '79 and uh, and also you know to see it in relation to 
you know, what now feels like another moment of crisis in the city, mm. which for you was probably actually a moment of opportunity, you know, back in 79. Well, it, it was interesting because, you know, that was the moment when a lot of artists and people, kids in art school and everything were creating this sort of art punk music. And then there was the real punks, you know, like the guys like Sid Vicious and the guys like, you know, um, I don't know, the guy from the Dead Boys, okay, Stiv Baders. And then there were the kind of college kids who had uh, taken music from various sources, whatever, Milton Babbitt or Edgar Varez and people like that and, and used these kind of uh, crazy ideas about electronic classical music from the 50s and 60s and put it together with with guitar, bass, and drums. Mm -hmm. And so we got a, an opportunity. I was in a band in Boston that we formed and um, it was called The Girls. And then we got a call to come down and play New York. And our the opening band was Basquiat's band. So John michel Basquiat was literally the first guy I met in New York City, only because he was setting up his equipment. We went in, you know, I met probably random taxi drivers or something to get there, but he was the first person that was kind of hunched down on the stage alone, putting some plugs in, you know, he had a clarinet at that time, I think, and he was kind of setting things up. And I went and spoke with him and I just asked him about like, you know, what kind of music do you guys do? And what, what do you, what's it like? And he, and he said, I said, you know, what do you do? And he said, I'm an artist. And I said, yeah, so am I. I said, I'm just doing this music thing to get me down into the art world. And he said, well, if you were, you know, you're from, you're from Boston, never going to make it as an artist in Boston. You have to move to New York. <laughs> he said that nobody in Boston is interested in, in new art. He said, you have to move to New York if that's the case. So then after the concert, we played together. He played first and then they sort of went their way. I, we played after and then I met up with him because he was probably having a drink and listened to us. And then he took me around to the Mud Club and all the kind of downtown cool places in New York. And um, it was very, at that point, it was very clear that I had to quit the band in Boston and move to New York. So I spoke to the guitar player and I said, let's just move to New York. <laughs> Forget about this stuff, this music band business. And so we moved and and then I, I you know, would see him frequently in New York. And, um, but the city was very different then. And they had the big checker cabs and um, there was, you could smoke cigarettes in the cab. I mean, there was no non-smoking New York, okay? And it was very, um, you know, it was divided in a sense between massive lower income projects and those guys from the projects were also very involved in the sort of, you know, I don't know what, like the punk scene in a strange way, they really loved it. And there was a lot of bands that sort of, like a lot of the audience were like white kids from, you know, colleges that were going to NYU and School of Visual Arts, and then a lot of black kids that were coming just from, you know, up, uptown or the Lower East Side or the projects, or they were students. And, um, you know, there was a tragic situation that happened with um, Michael Stewart. And the Guggenheim did the show about Michael Stewart. He was, you know, one night in 1980, whatever it was, 83. Yeah. Uh, this is a very cool, kid, very educated kid. And, and this was the first time that we confronted an actual racial barrier in the city where enough was enough, you know, like he was, he wasn't doing anything wrong. He was a, he was a, a kind of an intellectual guy that was a little bit like Basquiat, but not quite as um, visually accessible. Okay, he was just beginning. He'd done some modeling jobs and this and that, but he wasn't a graffiti artist. And he went out one night with a pen and wrote, they say he wrote on the subway, but the police clubbed him over the head and everybody found out that this kid, Michael Stewart was killed. And then it was a war against, from, uh, from 
from the, a war broke out between the artist and the and the police and the and the New York City mayor, and we really had like a kind of a our first Vietnam of the systemic racism that people are talking about today, where we said like this is just wrong, has to be fixed, and uh, so the artists really went into a revolt during the eighties, and it was amazing to see the the coalition of artists at that time that stood together to sort of make a statement about Michael Stewart and what had happened to him. And so New York was pretty unified between these different, you know, edges. Like, you know, the, the old fashioned taxi driver who was constantly swearing his head off and telling you crazy stories. And then the guys that were like opening the hip cool restaurants that were whatever, Andy Warhol was about, and so I don't know. New York was diff was different, but it, I think after the pandemic and a lot of business people and a lot of um, sort of very straight and sort of square characters are probably afraid to move back. That the youth will take over New York, and there's going to be a lot of new energy in the city, and there's going to be a real rebirth of that kind of um, sort of liberating artistic feeling where you, you know, who, who said you can't do what you want? Mm -hmm. That was the cool thing about New York. It's like, nobody said, nobody said you can't do whatever the hell you want. <laughs> you know, that's only <laughs> in other places. New York, you're allowed to do whatever you want. That was the beauty of New York back then. Mm -hmm. You also leave that maybe this is my last question, but uh, we can continue also by taking some questions from the audience. Is, uh, um, you know, you also lived in Cologne. You are one of these people that managed to live in multiple cities and to, <laughs> to have connections with them. Uh, you know, you mentioned Paris. Uh, you also spent time in Cologne in the 80s, right? Or uh, the cusp between the 80s, uh, okay. in a moment in which Cologne was uh, a capital or the capital of German art. Um, <laughs> and how did that feel like? I always like the fact that, you know, Cologne and New York have a very similar uh, area code. It's uh, they're both two one two or two two one, I think. And, yeah. uh, and there was a, a sort of dialogue now between the two cities in that moment. Um, it was so great. I mean, I went to see. You know, I'd met with um, Doc Peel and I'd met and I heard about Walter Don, the Mulheimer Freiheit, and I'd, I'd heard about these guys in New York when I was on the Lower East Side. Then I got, I had a, my first like group show where I had one painting in Amsterdam. So I went there, took the opportunity to say, I've never been to Europe before, I'm gonna go. And then I stayed three days in Amsterdam and I took the train down to Cologne, which is a short four hour trip or something. And uh, I met all those guys, Walter Don, Jerry uh, Dockerpeel, uh, Peter Bermels, Werner Butner, and then Albert Erlen, Martin Kippenberger, everybody would go to this one um, restaurant. And I'm trying to think of the name of it. It's sort of like the Odeon, but it was the place in Cologne. And so there were two schools. There was a Hamburg school and there was the Cologne school. And both schools totally sort of got along, but it was insane because they were, I mean, Kippy Kippenberger was so out of his mind most of the time that he would, by the time the restaurant cleared out, He'd usually be standing on the table, like screaming out art theories and people were talking about art and this and that. And all the artists were working like really hard. So I did a lot of paintings in the Klapperhof studio of Walter Don and Docker Peel. They let me use the studio. I did a lot of important pieces in terms of the early 80s. And then from there, I had never even thought of it or dreamed of it, but they were saying, oh, in Germany, you know, when we take a little vacation, we go to the Canary Islands. And I said, okay, that's very remote, but uh, and I went and I did my whole entire one man exhibition for New York at Barbara Gladstone and Pat Hearn in the Canary Islands. So <laughs> I've been everywhere, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've been everywhere. No matter where I think. I don't think it matters. I like painting in different places all the time. And how do you feel 
that you can connect with so many artists. I mean, that's uh, now uh, I'll ask you a very journalistic, silly question, but uh, you know, what's your um, what's your strategy to connect to so many artists? I mean, it's also quite amazing how you you really have relationship with many of your peers, with younger artists, and mm -hmm. how you remain both uh, very generous with you know with artists from different places and. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a question of not stealing uh, their ideas and them not stealing your ideas. So like, for example, between me and Jean-Michel Basquiat, I was making old master, fake old master paintings. So we could talk about some, and he was making sort of Cy Twombly-esque abstract expressionist paintings. And Keith Haring was doing a very sort of linear you know, with no paint at all, just lines. So we, the three of us never would sit around and say, yeah, that guy's totally ripping me off or this guy's totally ripping me off. And so the artists who you feel comfortable like that, like I never would think for a minute, a guy like Richard Serra <laughs> is ripping me off. So I get along with Richard Serra because his drawing exhibition was so awesome at the Met. And then Bryce, for example, from the older generation I'm talking, handed me my award, I remember, at the American Academy of Arts. And, um, and Rauschenberg got the Lifetime Award. And I remember, I remember it was really funny. Rauschenberg said to me, what'd they give you, eight grand? And I said, yeah. I said, that's what <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he said, yeah, that's what I got last time. I got that one too. And uh, <laughs> it was very funny, you know? And uh, I was there with Allen Ginsberg for that event, but um, all the different artists that I know, like Maurizio, completely different, you know, mindset in terms of how he creates an object. If you take Catalan, we can share a similar mentality, but the way the product or the or the the idea comes out, I mean, will blow my mind on my end and hopefully blow his mind on his end as to like how we can coexist as artists, but without, I'm not gonna tape a banana to the wall. And he knows that, but he can, he could come to me and tell me in private, I have a good idea. I think I'm just gonna take a banana and tape it to the wall. I'm not gonna try to do it before him. I yeah. love, you know what I mean? And then we, we with artists that I know like, like John Curran, for example, who's a really, you know, super, you know, great painter, ideas sometimes get crisscrossed. And, um, and that's interesting to a certain degree because on one hand, he's a very different, he's a completely different artist than I am. But on the other hand, we both share a love for old master painting. We share a love for technique. We share a love for all those kind of things. So, you know, I can find a common ground with, a lot of different artists like Dana Schutz or like this one and that one, just either the younger generation painters or they're like Rashid, for example. Rashid and I really share a lot of like mental uh, common ground. We may have a visual language that's completely different from another, but it's really easy to talk with them and hang out and like just, you know, just, I don't know, talk about like things we want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, George. We, we, if you're up for it, we'll take some questions. You know, one, uh, well, one is still from me, you know, the, the famous quote by uh, Rocher about Duchamp is that his greatest masterpiece was his use of time. And, uh, you know, I, I think the same about you in the sense that you, you managed to be knowledgeable about art, about literature, about music. And I even wonder how you structure your days and your time. And um, if there is a secret to that, or if it's more again about being open. And, uh, and this connects to a question here from our guest about uh, book recommendations, anything that has inspired you or had a big impact on you lately or, or historically. Um, that's a good question. Um, and the reason is because I have to get a pair of glasses um, to be able to read books. So I haven't really been very successful in reading because of that, you know, honestly. So I've just decided, like, I can't even think of the last book that inspired me. I have no recollection of a book 
that I can think of um, that was really inspirational to me. Uh, there is a, a nice funny question, which is, do you think art school is worth the price tag? Did you go to art school? I don't remember. No, I think it's not worth the price tag. <laughs> I don't think it is. I think that for students who are, go to art school, the only reason to go is to find out if there's something they know that you don't. If you know more, if in your mind you think you know more than they do, don't let them tell you how to paint or how to make art, because it can be very dangerous. And, and, and it goes back in time to, uh, you know, I always think it's a funny story when in music where Beethoven went and his parents brought him to take a lesson from Mozart. And they said, why did you go? You know, he was a slightly, maybe very little in age difference, even though Mozart was totally famous because he was so young when he did everything. And Beethoven's answer was, I only went to see if there was something he knew that I didn't. <laughs> and I think that's why if you go to art school, once you realize they don't know more than you do, that's when you should leave <laughs> and become an artist. There is now a lot of questions coming in, which is fun. Um, which is, uh, oh, one is interesting. How do you deal with feeling blocked or unsure how to move forward with a piece? You just make it and look to see what had happened later. Don't think in advance. Don't hesitate. If you hesitate and you don't just go at it, you uh, it's like looking at a beautiful cooked dinner on your plate and waiting till it gets cold. And so when you're looking at a white canvas, don't think in advance, don't map out your thoughts. Let them map themselves and then you go in and you organize those things. Actually, for these cycles of paintings, do they start with drawings on the canvas or you just go to the canvas with, I mean, these do you that I, Yeah, these are total improvisations. Starts from a white canvas. I then put like a very sort of, I don't know, intuitive background, sort of an abstract expressionist almost kind of feeling like as if I was painting a sort of watery uh, Joan Mitchell or a, or a de Kooning or something like that, let it dry. And then I take a black stick and I start to make a drawing and shading them in and then starting to add paint. So I don't even get back from the painting until I have an entire drawing. In. I don't even look at what I'm doing until something's there. Uh, let's see if there are other questions. Tell me if you're up to, to get some more. How do you free from technique? This is an interesting question because on many levels, you have a facility or a virtuosity that is quite exceptional, no? And uh, um, at the same time, how do you do you feel a, an impetus to free yourself from technique, or or how do you play with that difference, you know, between virtuosity and improvisation, or or conscious and unconscious? I think what you do is you um, you use everything you have to make the best thing you can possibly make. You can't blame yourself for being a good draftsman you can't blame yourself for being a good colorist you can't you can't take it on as a negative you have to take all those aspects as a positive and then what you do is you use them all to break free of your patterns so that in other words you are breaking the form by using all of those uh, innate talents in order to break the form and create a new one so you basically have to use all that in order, you can't, you can't try to pretend you don't know what you're doing. You have to say, I know what I'm doing, but here I am at an impasse. Here I'm at a moment where I, too, I know too much what I'm doing. I know too well what I'm doing. So I've got to throw myself some curveballs, or I've got to throw myself some places where the mistakes become the entry to the new language or the, to the new composition. And so you consciously, you know, make some mistakes. Nobody's watching. You do it yourself. You know, you consciously, you know, get rid of something in the painting. Or you either start with something that's going to end up gone at the end. So basically, you have to use everything you've got to make a good work of art. Do you ever paint uh, against uh, something? I mean, let's say internalize the 
yeah. ad- artists or, or against artistry or... Um... Yeah, totally, all the time. I mean, in these improvisations, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm imagining a guy like John Coltrane doing my favorite things, where he's playing a song that everybody knows and then his variations and how far he takes out a simple motif, like we talked about these idea of motific developments and and uh, and sort of uh, music. And there are artistic, there are paintingly, painterly motifs. Okay, there are motifs where you might decide, like a form, you're going to follow that form and continue with that form. And then by the time you've done all that, knock it out, get rid of it. But the ghost of that form will bring on a new structure. I don't know how it works, but it does. <laughs> well, it clearly keeps uh, working. So uh, we keep getting questions, but I don't know uh, yeah. if yeah. We, we can manage them all. But um, mm. I think this was great, George. It's always super generous of you. And uh, it's always yeah. a pleasure to see you and to hear you. And hopefully, we'll also see in person soon. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Really do. Congratulations <laughs> for the wonderful show. And uh, mm-hmm. I guess now the gallery will have to open a mailbox for sending questions to George because they keep coming in. But thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, no, you're fabulous. I love you. Thank <laughs> sure, you.